So today I'm going to be talking to you about Wi-Fi calling, what it is and what the benefits are, and how to actually configure it on your network. So Roel mentioned it earlier, you know, about technologies that come from the home. Home Wi-Fi is not the same as enterprise Wi-Fi. We've seen plenty of cases of applications that make it from the consumer market into the enterprise ne network. You know, trying to set up AirPlay and Google Chrome on your enterprise network is not as fun and easy as it works at home. So, have you ever been in a situation where you're trying to make a cellular call, it's in really dodgy coverage, you're trying to make the call go through, it just doesn't connect or it drops out or you've got one-way audio, and you look down at your phone and you've got, you know, one bar, no bars of cell signal, but you've got full bars of Wi-Fi signal. That's where Wi-Fi calling comes in. So we're going to talk about what Wi-Fi calling is and how it works, some of the benefits of Wi-Fi calling, carrier support for Wi-Fi calling, so not all carriers support it, but most of them do these days. Uh, device support, most devices support it too, but there's some caveats to that. We'll talk about security, how the Wi-Fi call is actually established between your handset and your carrier, and then we'll talk a little bit about designing your enterprise Wi-Fi network for support for Wi-Fi calling. So Wi-Fi calling tends to get lumped in with things like Skype, Link, Jabber, FaceTime, Facebook calling, all that sort of stuff. It's not the same as that, it is slightly different. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So basically, Wi-Fi calling is a carrier offload feature which uses your Wi-Fi coverage to enable cellular calls in areas of poor cellular coverage. Uh, it's pretty neat. So it basically extends that last mile for mobile network operators and mobile virtual network operators where they can't quite get their signal everywhere. It uses a technology called generic access network which is basically extending the, uh, the cellular voice and data through your Wi-Fi and through the internet connection back to an evolved packet data gateway and into the carrier's core network. So I like this diagram here, it's quite simple. On the left-hand side, you've got your smartphone, your handset, so it wraps up all of your, your voice data and it transmits it across the, the top part of the section, which is your Wi-Fi and your internet IP network, over to the carrier on the right-hand side where it gets all um, processed by the evolved packet data core, uh, sorry, the evolved packet data gateway and then the LTE core, and then obviously the return traffic comes back through the same path. If you weren't using Wi-Fi calling, it would be taking the bottom path through the LTE network as you're typically used to. So we've already mentioned a benefit there, making and receiving cellular calls in areas of poor coverage over your Wi-Fi network. So this could be where maybe it's a, a construction area, maybe it's a new building that's coming up, um, I've been in plenty of examples where we've rolled out Wi-Fi for a new building and the carrier DAS system isn't live yet. So how do all the star IT staff get online and make phone calls and you know, contact people that they need to? All the contractors are trying to contact people. If the Wi-Fi is up and the network is up, they can start using that service there to make those calls to wherever they need to go before the actual DAS system comes up live in the building. Seamless smartphone experience. So this is device dependent. So you know, Apple iPhones, Wi-Fi calling is built in. Samsung Galaxy Wi-Fi calling is built in. Uh, some carriers slash phones require to use an application. Um, that's typically for the authentication side of things, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next. High-definition voice calls. So Wi-Fi calling goes in hand with voice over LTE. A lot of you have probably heard about voice over LTE. Um, it basically comes in with 4G uh, cellular offerings where the carriers can enable high-definition voice quality calls. So this is designed to ex extend and mimic that experience uh, so you're having high-definition voice calls going over your Wi-Fi. So that's definitely something to consider that we'll talk about later on as well. And we've talked about enhanced indoor coverage for mobile network operators. So there's a lot of people, which I agree with, that are on the frame of mind that, you know, if you want coverage from your cellular carrier, the cellular carrier should be doing the job of providing that coverage. They should have their infrastructure, they should have their antennas in buildings and shopping centres, retails, wherever you need it. But there's typically a lot of places, maybe out in rural areas, maybe you've got some valleys, you've got some dips, and it's kind of hard to get that coverage out of there. This is where Wi-Fi calling comes in. So carrier support. I know back in the day, I think T-Mobile was one of the first carriers that enabled Wi-Fi calling support for their customers, and Orange over in Europe also enabled it. Um, there's quite a few carriers now in both North and South America. Some of the South American carriers are still sort of in a technical pilot phase. They haven't officially launched it, um, but the service is there for their customers. Uh, quite a few carriers in the EMEA region, and most of the major carriers in Asia-Pacific region support it as well. 
So iPhone iOS 8 or higher, it was natively supported in, uh, in Apple iPhones for Wi-Fi calling, which is nice. Uh, Android devices do support it, but as I mentioned, they do require an app sometimes. That really depends on the flavor of Android, the, the handset manufacturer, and how they've set up the operating system for you. So enabling Wi-Fi calling, this is just a quick snapshot of what it was like on Telstra back home in Australia, enabling it. Literally all I had to do was click a radio button and Wi-Fi calling works. So depending on your carry support, depending on your phone, sometimes you have to force Wi-Fi calling to be enabled by putting your phone, your plane in, uh, sorry, your phone into airplane mode, um, which seems a bit counterintuitive because you're trying to make use of the cellular signals when you can. Um, that's really dependent on how the carrier deploys those settings to your phone and actually sets the thresholds for when it should engage Wi-Fi calling automatically on the phone or not. Just a little highlight there. Uh, especially in the US, the FCC actually requires you, when you enable Wi-Fi calling, to enter your home address. Just a regulatory uh, requirement for emergency uh, call address location. So I popped up a, a couple of links there for some carriers. Uh, Telstra, Verizon, and AT&T, they have some good guides for most consumers on their network, uh, how they can actually enable Wi-Fi calling. So I recommend checking them out because they actually do provide a little bit more detail, which will you know, keep us satisfied with some technical detail, especially, especially the Telstra one. It's got some information about the call setup and the security requirements and things like that. So on the topic of security, the smartphone actually has to form a tunnel between you know, the smartphone across your Wi-Fi to the carrier network. And the way it does this is using IPsec with an ESP uh, tunnel, and it uses NAT traversal. The reason why it uses NAT traversal is because ESP is IP protocol 50. So coming from a private environment, whether it's at home or your enterprise, you can't NAT uh, ESP out to your uh, public internet connection. So you have to wrap it up in UDP port 500, and then you, you can NAT that out. So that's what NAT traversal is. Authentication occurs with a key exchange and an EPTLS certificate handshake. So authentication is pretty much similar to the way that Hotspot 2.0 works. Um, and it can support a multiple different methods of authentication. I've used the example of EPTLS there. Uh, it can use EPSIM, it can use credentials that are stored on your SIM card, or it can use another app where it actually uses credentials. So I might have my Telstra username, account, and password. Maybe Telstra might require me on certain devices to use that app to log in and authenticate Wi-Fi calling that way. But typically it's using EPSIM. And the whole secure tunnel uses SHA-256 encryption, which is good we wouldn't want it any other way. Security tunnel setup. So we'll just go through the process here of uh, a packet capture where the, where the actual call was established between my iPhone and the carrier. So on the left-hand side at the top there, you've got the 192.26 address at the end there. That's my iPhone. And it starts to search around for some carrier known addresses that are programmed into the phone. So you've got some 192, uh, sorry, you've got some 122 and some 17 IP addresses there. That's where it's trying to discover the gateways on the Telstra network there. You can see it's using port 443 outbound, um, TLS version 1.2. And you can see there, there's some client hellos that go out. There's a few retransmissions there. So it keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying. And then it actually gets a response from one of the cores coming, one of the gateways coming back, one of the 17.248 uh, addresses. And it's saying, uh, you know, I've got a server hello though. So, so someone's actually responded. We've got a response from one of the gateways, which is good. So next, what happens is the certificate exchange. So similar to any sort of uh, TLS or, you know, EAP certificate exchange, a handshake goes backwards and forwards. You can see some further uh, exchanges there between the phone and the gateway. And then right at the bottom, you can see where the call has been established and you can see that the protocol it's using is ESP, but it's using port UDP 4500. So right down the bottom there, you can have a look at the packet decode and see that we're using, uh, you know, SHA-256 is the cipher suite. So with that in mind, uh, a lot of networks are quite hardened. There's a lot of restrictions on your firewall walls, both inbound and outbound from your network. I'm sure a lot of you are probably already allowing TCP 443, HTTPS, and TLS inbound and outbound for certain things, but you're probably not using UDP 500 for ISOCAMP. So ISOCAMP is used as part of the discovery for NAT traversal capabilities at both ends, and then you obviously need the UDP 4500 for the actual ESP uh, with NAT traversal. 
voice over Wi-Fi design. So this is where you can sort of talk about many related Wi-Fi uh, applications that are using voice or video over Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi calling is one of them. It's no different. So I've actually come across deployments that have used wired and wireless voice extensively. You know, Cisco IP handsets or ASCOM handsets. The Quas works brilliantly. Um, they go and someone asks them to enable Wi-Fi calling. They do the security bit done and they just completely forget about the cause for Wi-Fi calling, and it, they wonder why it doesn't work. So this is, this is what we're talking about here, to keep it in the top of your minds if you come across this in your environment. So you have both wired and wireless network design considerations. Any voice over Wi-Fi design has some very strict requirements on the, on the wireless side to make sure that you have you know, decent RF design, AP placements, the bands that you're going to use for Wi-Fi calling. You know, maybe Wi-Fi calling is one of those requests that's coming from guests or visitors to your network. Maybe you're only offering guests on 2.4 gigahertz, and that might not be the best experience for Wi-Fi calling. Or it might be a BYD scenario, or it might be on your managed corporate devices that you want to enable Wi-Fi calling. So the band is going to come into consideration there. Channel planning, you know, whether you can use DFS channels or not, that's going to have an impact on voice reliability and any reactions to changes in DFS events. And data rates. Having a high-density data-ready Wireless deployment with only high data rates enabled is not necessarily going to give you the best experience for roaming with voice over Wi-Fi, so you need to consider that too. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there. There's a lot of information on the web about best practices for designs for voice over Wi-Fi. I know many of you in this room have done voice over Wi-Fi and have excellent blog posts and recommendations, so definitely seek that out. Um, the next thing to consider is fast roaming optimizations and then whether your device, devices support that. So 8 to 11K, R and V, if your Wi-Fi infrastructure can support it, that's good. And you've got to test whether your devices support it too. So depending on your Wi-Fi vendor, depending on your handset manufacturer, you've got things like 8 to 11V that can actually assist with the handover from Wi-Fi to cellular. Not many people do that, not many people know about that or play with it, but um, you can have a look at some of the, the references that I've got later on, you'll find some information about it. How do your devices roam? So that's considering your device cap capabilities. We always need to design for our device capabilities and obviously the applications that they want to use. And round trip latency. So this is a requirement for any voice network, whether it's wide VoIP or voice over Wi-Fi. We want to keep that round trip latency down below 150 milliseconds, otherwise you're going to start getting some some drops in audio or one-way conversations or, or packet loss there. So that's definitely a consideration when you're talking about roaming with voice over Wi-Fi. Now let's have a look at the capacity side of the equation. So this is where uh, Wi-Fi calling is quite different to a lot of other voice over Wi-Fi applications. So it's not like SIP. It's not like any of the other you know, G G722 codecs or G729 going over your Wi-Fi. It's not like Skype. It's not like uh, FaceTime video or anything like that. It uses 100 to 120 kilobits per second per call. So you have to allow for this specific uh, application is different from anything else, and you should be treating it accordingly. The Wi-Fi considerations. So if you've never done voice over Wi-Fi and you haven't had to consider this side of capacity before, uh, you need to consider the number of calls per AP that your Wi-Fi network can handle and the number of calls per, per quas queue as well. I'm going to use some Cisco terms here. You know, you've got platinum quas is what you should have enabled on there so that you're accepting the markings of the, of the high priority traffic. Uh, support for voice WMMM, not all smartphones support that. Uh, you know, iPhones do, which is good. Um, whether you've got anything that is related to application visibility and control or using some analytics or signature detection on your Wi-Fi network to help automatically prioritize and uh, apply quas to that traffic, that's going to be a benefit to you. Uh, device capabilities, it ties into the things I've said before, you know, whether you can support voice WMM, whether you can support those fast roaming considerations, uh, whether you can support, uh, you know, actually configuring how the smartphone marks those voice packets. So, for example, if you're using Apple iPhones, you can use the Apple configurator to make sure that Wi-Fi calling is being marked with DSCP expedited forwarding. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with that is you actually need to make sure you're whitelisting FaceTime uh, video and audio to actually get white, uh, to whitelist the Wi-Fi calling traffic as well. Wired LAN quas mapping, so this is where you've got to consider both the Wi-Fi and the wired side. Uh, you need to make sure that you're marking through your network at DSCP EF. You've got user priority six. It's going to be coming through access 
category voice from your Wi-Fi network. So all across your network, whether it's across the LAN, whether it's across the WAN, you need to make sure that that's being marked properly, just like you do with wired voice. So you might have some branch sites which are using Wi-Fi calling, and that traffic is traversing the WAN before it hops off onto the internet. So you need to make sure that that's being marked properly on the WAN as well. It's probably very rare that you've got control or any option of quas on your internet service. If you've got some high-end business-grade internet service, sometimes they do offer some light levels of quas there. But it's you know if you can sort of apply quas inbound from any of your carriers for Wi-Fi calling, that's going to help the experience too. So vendors. So most of the most of the main vendors support Wi-Fi calling. It's not really something that they do or don't support, but some of them have a few different little ways that they can handle it, optimize it, or tweak it, or you know make it work easier for you, or make it easier to administer on your network. So I highly recommend going out and checking these resources. There's some great white papers. There's some great deployment guides, and some references in there for whichever particular vendor you use. It's going to give you some information to how to get Wi-Fi calling working best on your network. So that's a very light scratch of the surface there. Uh, you can find out some more information at my blog. I've got some links to those, uh, those vendors in there as well. And I uh, hope that was very useful for you. If you have any questions, feel free to come and grab me later on throughout the conference. And thank you very much. Hello.